Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the seven-word tweet that proved too much for Beijing. The NBA counts the cost as China silences critics and access to its $14 trillion economy. A few years back, you could rent an oil tanker for less than the price of hiring a Ferrari. Prices, though, are now soaring. We'll tell you why. And Malaysia's fish farmers face hefty financial losses as pollution destroys the coastline. President Donald Trump called it a substantial phase one agreement, but any talk of a truce in the trade war is pretty wide of the mark. Washington hasn't removed any tariffs and got a little relief for its farmers. Beijing got crucial access to pork after its pig farmers were decimated by swine flu. Substantive issues still remain, and there's an ongoing economic war in all but name. Washington slammed 28 Chinese tech companies with sanctions for their part in the repression of Uyghur Muslims. Meantime, Beijing is using access to the Chinese market as a weapon against those who criticize its policies and handling of Hong Kong protests. The NBA was the latest to step into the Chinese quagmire, as Al Jazeera's Rob Matheson reports from Beijing. It seems one of the fastest ways for U.S. basketball to risk losing billions of dollars of Chinese investment has been a seven-word tweet. Daryl Morey, general manager of the Houston Rockets NBA team, voiced his support for Hong Kong protesters. Now Chinese companies have been suspending sponsorship deals and TV coverage from NBA games. We can no longer watch Rockets matches, so I think lots of Rockets fans will be very sad. But of course, this matter involves state-level issues, so we can't allow this to happen. The U.S. National Basketball Association has had a presence in China for more than 30 years. It's estimated about 300 million people in China regularly play basketball. A few months ago, the Chinese company Tencent spent over one and a half billion dollars securing the rights to continue streaming NBA games in China for the next five years. And that's good news for about 500 million Chinese basketball fans who regularly watch those matches. In 2018, it's estimated that the NBA's market in China was worth four billion dollars. China's sensitivity about the Hong Kong protests hasn't just affected the NBA. A video gamer was banned by gaming company Activision Blizzard for apparently supporting the Hong Kong demonstrations. Blizzard has insisted its decision was based on gaming rules and not on its China connections. A chief economist at Swiss bankers UBS said in a podcast that an outbreak of swine flu in China would only matter to Chinese pigs. Parts of China's financial sector called the comments distasteful and racist. Other companies, including Gap Clothing, Marriott Hotels and the Daimler Car Group, have been forced to apologize to China. I think it's a different value mindset. Uh, in the Western country, you said a freedom of speech. Uh, in China, we also have freedom of speech. But some area that uh, you shouldn't touch, particularly this is the bottom line. China seems to be saying that for those who rely on its money, there are some lines which cannot be crossed. Joining us now via Skype from Manchester in the UK, Simon Chadwick. Simon is a professor of sports enterprise at Salford Business School uh, in Manchester. Good to have you with us, uh, Simon. How do you see all of this playing out? I mean, the NBA is a pretty big deal in China, not only in terms of sport, but in terms of jobs. I was actually really surprised by this incident because the NBA for the best part of two decades now has not only invested a lot of money, but has also invested a lot, a lot of time into uh, their activities in China. And this has really helped to not only boost um, the NBA in China itself, but also to, to boost bas basketball more generally. And so what you'll typically find is, is many young Chinese people uh, are either active participants in basketball or, or, or else watch basketball. So I, I think you know, clearly this is a major incident, but I do expect it um, 
to, to, to die down in the medium to long term. I think in the short to medium term, there's going to be some turbulence. And certainly this week compared to, to last week, it's been uh, rather quieter. Um, but basketball really and, and the NBA and China really are, are so intertwined with one another. I think there will be a, a, a way forward ultimately for all concerned. What does it mean for, for businesses away from sport who, who want to tap into this $14 trillion economy? I mean, you'd have to take some pretty extraordinary measures to restrict the freedom of expression of your employees, wouldn't you? Well, it's very interesting because over the last 10 days, we have seen some businesses, some sponsors, commercial partners, broadcasters really stepping back from uh, from China, from the NBA, from coverage of, of, of games that have taken place uh, in China involving NBA teams during that period. Uh, I think what it does show, and, and we've seen this in other industrial sectors, uh, is that sport will now have to confront the reality of if it wishes to do business in China, there is a certain way of saying and doing things. And I guess in some ways this is not unusual because if you are operating in Qatar, if you're operating in Great Britain, the same is true. There, there are local norms, local ways of doing things. But I think ideologically in, in China, politically, it is so highly charged that essentially what we are beginning to see is, is, is really this clash of ideologies whereby principles of uh, Western principles of free speech and, and open speech are, are being moderated or even curbed by uh, the political necessities of operating in China. And, and uh, as I say, it's the NBA this time, but I think moving forwards from here, we'll find lots of other organizations in sport, in football, in motorsport and, and other areas facing similar issues. I, I want to read you a quote which perhaps sums up what, what you were saying. It, it's from uh, Ben Hunt from Epsilon Theory. Uh, he, he says that, that companies need to make a choice. He says, do you want to preserve your authenticity and your brand or do you want to preserve your earnings guidance and share price? Choose one, he says. You can't have both. If you're going to do business in China, I have to concur with that. Uh, as somebody who is a regular visitor to China, um, it is very clear that there are certain norms of behavior that you have to comply with. Uh, but those norms of behavior are, are very firmly embedded within a, in a very strongly political context. And, and it's very clear in, in China, if, if you want to operate in China as a business, as an organization, if you want to succeed, if you want to build a fan base, if you want to um, secure a financial return, make a profit, then there are the rules of the game and you have to comply with those rules. And if you don't, what you will, do, what you will find is, is that you slip into the situation that the NBA now finds itself in. And, and, and so I do agree with that quote. I think it's very, very difficult to find a middle way. There is only one way in China. China, and you either accept it or you don't. And coming back to the NBA, sports has, has always been uh, thrust into geopolitical tensions. I mean, thinking about Formula One in Bahrain, uh, Anthony Joshua about to fight in Saudi Arabia. Uh, why are our sports men and women and managers expected to keep stumm? Uh, one, we hear, you know, from diplomats who, and, and many business leaders who, who manage to get away with, 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 with you know, uh, saying things that aren't palatable to the countries in which they're based. The first thing I think I would say is, is, is we're not in, in new territory. Uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember the Cold War, uh, and, and, and some of us will remember further back than that. If you go back to, for instance, the, the 1936 Olympics um, when Adolf Hitler was in power in Germany, uh, sport and politics, despite their often uneasy relationship, have, have always had to coexist to a greater or a lesser extent. So we're seeing this playing out again in, in China with the NBA. So I think that, that that's an important contextual detail to, 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 uh, to, to, to mention. But I think for individual athletes, obviously, they, these, these people are incredibly high profile. They are people who are constantly in the public spotlight. They are not only representatives of themselves, of their own brands, they are also representatives of their sports. But I think to a certain extent, too, the, the, these, these athletes and teams are also representatives of the, of the countries from which they're, they're from, where they're, where they're located. And... Historically, I think there's been this view that uh, a footballer just plays football and a boxer just boxes. But increasingly, what we know is, is what they say, how they behave, is scrutinised to such a large extent that you are no longer just a racing driver. You, know, you are no longer just a footballer. Effectively, what you are is, is you are communicating a, a message, a set of values, a strategic position, 
And so increasingly what we're now finding is, is that there is training for athletes. There's training for, for, for people working for teams because their words potentially can be so highly charged um, that these can cause the kinds of problems that we've seen with the NBA. And again, this is why I find what has happened with the NBA over the last 10, 10 days actually really surprising because uh, historically and typically the NBA is always very measured and very careful in the way that it communicates with the world. Simon, it's been really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Professor, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Now, here's something that hasn't been widely reported but has consequences for all of us. The cost of shipping crude around the world has shot up to 11-year highs after the United States blacklisted Chinese ships. More than 40 VLCCs, or very large crude carriers, operated by China's Costco Shipping Energy Transportation, have been blacklisted for moving sanctioned Iranian oil. Costco has a total of 1,100 ships. Iran's oil tankers, estimated to be around 54, have also been sanctioned. In total, nearly 300 tankers have been blacklisted, including Venezuela's. That represents about 3% of the world's oil tanker fleet, according to Refinitiv. Icon. That sent the cost of hiring a ship from $18,000 to almost $300,000 a day. To ship crude from the US Gulf to Asia, the longest route to ship oil now costs around $14 million. Well, add to that, sanctioned countries are still managing to get crude to customers by offloading at sea and switching off tracking devices. Who better to pick all this up with than Rajat Kapoor, Managing Director of Oil and Gas at AWR Lloyd. Thanks for being with us, uh, Rajat. So what needs to happen to bring tanker prices down? Should we be concerned here? Who's shouldering the cost? Uh, obviously, a big effect of the tanker prices and, the way they, and where they are today has got to do with the current sanctions that the US administration has put on Iranian crude. Uh, in order to prevent offloading of Iranian crude in the high seas, in order to stop, at least to, to the bare minimum, export of crude to China, uh, the U.S., as you know, last month imposed sanctions on the tanker subsidiaries of Costco, which is uh, China's shipping uh, line and is the largest shipping line in the world. So once you have the sanctions coming in from the U.S. on these entities, on these particular tankers, they suddenly become hotcakes. Nobody wants to touch these tankers. And this, these volumes are then taken off the international trade. And that's, that's, that's a substantial piece of hardware that goes out. And obviously, supply demand, uh, uh, the, the, the prices shoot up. We've also got to realize that it's not just the Iranian-China connection. There are, there are other aspects to the increase in tanker trade as well. As you know, the Venezuelan uh, sanctions are also in place. Similar to Iranian crude, tankers handling Venezuelan crude are also under the lens. That puts away another piece of kit out of uh, circulation. And as you know, the IMO 2020 uh, restrictions are set to kick in in the next three months, uh, which basically means that the ships need to adhere to a rather stricter uh, level of pollution control. So a good number of ships have actually in the docks and, and they are going in for upgrades, scrubbers and things like that. So all these things, three things put together, is what is currently impacting the rise in the tanker freights. Is that cost, though, that increase in cost being passed on to the likes of you and I? Obviously, uh, the, the crude uh, transporter or whether it's the refiner that is taking in the crude, once he's got to pay an additional cost to ship his crude, He's going to mark his products, the final end product that comes out of the refinery, the gasoline, the petrol, the uh, LPG, at a higher cost, which you and I have to pay, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Iran uh, has always said that it has the means to get oil onto the market in spite of the sanctions. There is a, a lot of sanctions busting going on here. How's that happening? Um, you, 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 you've got to realize, uh, uh, Adrian, I mean, even if we look back 30, 40, 50 years in, in, in history, the informal crude trade, the, the informal crude sale, whether it was the barter system or what is the off-market sale of crude, has always existed in Iran. From the times of the Shah in the 70s, when Iran was producing at its peak at about 6 million barrels of crude, there were always barrels that were available off the coast of Iran, north of uh, uh, the coastline of the Arabian uh, Gulf states, where crude was sold informally. Of course, that was, and, and that has continued till this day. I mean, if, if you were to stand on any 
any one of the Gulf states along the coastline and with the high-powered binoculars, you, you, you could even today see these small barges having 20, 30, 40,000 barrels of crude, which was obviously Iranian in origin, and it was being sold at high seas. So Iran has always found a way to get its crude, to sell its crude away from the eyes of the formal market, as it were. Of course, this, this crude was either pilfered, was either uh, 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 siphoned off given the seepages in the Iran uh, supply chain. But now what we're seeing is a sort of a state, if not sponsored, then state-sanctioned sale of Iranian crude away from the prying eyes okay. uh, uh, of, so, of the West. So, so help me understand uh, and that this. is happening by means of high yeah. seas transfer, uh, things like yeah. that. Help me understand this then. then. As far as the sanctions are concerned, Iran is still able to trade with any anyone it wants in terms of oil. It's just that the payment can't be in dollars. Is, is that how the sanctions work? So it's OK for them to, to come offshore and offload from one tanker to another as long as the payment isn't in dollars? The, the, the most kind of stringent aspect of the sanctions that came in uh, early, early last year was Section 1245 of the NDAA, the, the, the National Defence Authorization Act, which actually imposes penalties on financial institutions which are in any way connected with Iranian and Iranian crude. That includes banks, financial uh, institutions, lenders, and government treasuries as well. So whilst Iran has the crude, and whilst there is a huge appetite, at least amongst Asian consumers, to take that crude, very few people are reluctant to get that crude into their, refin into their inventories and refineries because it's difficult to pay for it. How do you pay for it? I Iran, for the longest period of time, never accepted dollars. They had benchmarked their crude in euros. Uh, 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 for the longest period of time. Any, even when the sanctions were not there, and IOC, and IGC always dealt in euros, not in dollars. Today, even that is difficult. Iran is today selling its crude. It's, it's down from three and a half mi uh, million barrels, four million barrels a day. Uh, it was about three million barrels uh, per day earlier this year. Even today, by most estimates, they are still selling 400,000 odd barrels of crude every day. Uh, a lot of that is is money that is routed away from international banking channels. Some amount of it is done in barter system, uh, uh, white goods, iPads, uh, 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 iPhones, washing machines, the likes. Uh, and there is a good amount of crude that is currently being sold on credit by the Iranian government in the hope that when the sanctions go, they'll be able to encash that IOU. Fascinating. Rajat, many thanks indeed for being with us. Really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Thank you, Adrian. Good to be here. Now, for years, the US has complained that the EU has illegally subsidised Airbus, putting the American plane manufacturer Boeing at a financial disadvantage. Now, the World Trade Organization agrees, and it says the US can impose $7.5 billion in tariffs on a wide range of European products in response. Those tariffs, which have just kicked in and a drop in olive oil prices, are putting Spain's olive industry under enormous pressure. Al Jazeera's Charlie Angela looks at the repercussions of those tariffs on the families that depend on olive oil exports for their livelihood. Harvest time in Spain should be a time for celebration. But for olive growers this year, it's a time of anxiety. As they shake down the trees, the U.S. is imposing a new 25% import tax on their olive oil, a tax that could decimate this fifth-generation family business unable to compete with cheaper imports. The vessels that are carrying Spanish olive oil to the States haven't even reached their destination, so what's going to happen? They were sold before these tariffs were a threat, so putting a 25% margin on top of this will kill our competitiveness. Spain is the world's largest producer of olive oil. Exports to the US are worth $440 million. But those working in the fields have not had it easy lately. Last year's record harvest caused olive oil's purchase price to plummet by 44%, and more and more countries are planting their own olive groves, joining the market. Piling the tariffs on top of this could lead to collapse. Last week, thousands of olive workers took to the streets of Madrid, demanding the EU push back on the new tariffs and prop up the industry. 
They say they don't understand why an agreement that politicians had with Airbus should penalise their products. We think it's very unfair because the agricultural sector acts like a monetary exchange for other industries that have nothing to do with the sector. In this case, it's the aeronautical industry, which has nothing to do with us. While olive producers are already feeling the squeeze, around $845 million worth of Spain's agricultural exports will face US tariffs. The EU warns it will retaliate with its own import taxes if they win their parallel case against the US next year. It all has the makings of a tit-for-tat trade war. Fish farmers in northern Malaysia are calling on the government to tackle the issue of marine pollution. They say the poor quality of seawater has caused them huge financial losses. Al Jazeera's Florence Louis reports now from the state of Penang. There have been fish farms here at the mouth of the Korean River in Penang, northern Malaysia, for more than 40 years. But owners say the quality of the seawater is degrading, and they believe that's causing their fish to die. They blame a nearby landfill for polluting the water. We depend on the sea for a living. If our fish can't survive, we are going to have to shut the farm. If there's no fish in these waters, we'll be out of job as well. On the northern shores of Penang Island, Wong Tian Sui says his caged fish have been dying as well. He too blames the water quality. The state government says the polluting of seawater may be caused by runoffs from an illegal quarry operating nearby. Marine researchers say the increase in jellyfish off the coast of Penang is an indicator that the seawater is becoming more polluted, but say their studies suggest that that's not enough to cause fish to die. I mean, as a scientist, you know, it's difficult for us to actually pinpoint on one factor. The ocean is a very dynamic environment. Um, it's a both anthropogenic effects as well as climate due to climate change that causes coastal pollution. It's not just those in the fishing and aquaculture industries who are affected. Water sport operators as well as hoteliers tell us that on some days the pollution from this river is so bad that a foul smell hangs in the air and the water turns into a dark, almost black colour. On those days, they tell customers to avoid swimming in the sea. The local government says residents have to do their part. This so-called illegal discharge into the drainage system. The people does not do the oil filtration, they just pour into the sewage system and choke out the whole system. But the people here tell us they don't think enough is being done to ensure there's proper environmental monitoring, nor tackle coastal pollution. In Bangladesh, steel prices are soaring, and it's mainly because of the trade war between the US and China. It's having a knock-on effect on the rest of the economy, with house prices skyrocketing and construction taking a hit. Al Jazeera's Tanvir Chowdhury has more now from the town of Tongi. Small home builders are the hardest hit. The shop owner lives with his extended family next door to where his future home should be taking shape. Building a roof needs a lot of rods. If the prices were like before, it would be done by now. But with steel prices shooting up, work on building our home, our lifelong dream has stalled. Now we wait for the prices to go down. Bangladesh relies on importing scrap metal from the U.S. to make steel rod, which are the backbone of the new buildings. But they have become more expensive to build because the import costs have risen. President Trump's trade war with China is impacting Bangladesh's steel industry, which imports a significant amount of scrap iron from the United States. Protectionist measures taken by the U.S. administration is reducing supply and increasing prices. And so, the cost of constructions have gone up in Bangladesh. The capital Dhaka is the hub of the steel rod market. Steel traders say business is bad. Yes, there's an impact, with sales almost coming to a halt. People who are planning to build a home are very cautious now, as they have to borrow money, while the market is volatile. Some steel traders are stockpiling stocks betting prices will rise when or if the trade war eventually ends. Yes, the prices changed uh, for, I think, more on speculation. 
and it went, uh, it went up sharp. President Trump's tariffs are costing poorer countries as well as his own and China. There's been a construction boom in Bangladesh over the past 20 years or so. But the higher price of construction materials, such as steel, are threatening to stall recent economic growth. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, you can tweet me. I'm at A. Finnegan on Twitter. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or you can drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page, and there you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Costs. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.